Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight, um, and thank you for inviting me to talk. I feel really privileged to do so. Um, so I am a lecturer at the University of Exeter, and I'm actually an aquatic animal physiologist. So I'm really interested in how aquatic animals cope in a different environment, and more importantly, how changes in their environment change how they function. And a large area of my research is looking at climate change, and there'll be a central theme of climate change throughout this talk. Um, so if you're wondering why I kind of focus on that area, that's why. Um, very quickly, I've actually put a bit of a quiz up, so anyone online or if you've got your phones on you, if you go to www.menti.com and the code is at the top of the slide, it will stay there for a couple of slides, so you can keep doing this. And I've put three questions on there. They're fairly provocative, um, so it's an answer from one to five, um, with one being strongly disagree, five strongly agree, and then we'll kind of see what this looks like at the end in the questions, we can kind of review what everyone's thinking. Okay, but I really like doing this talk. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about, but it also gives me the opportunity to introduce this. Oh, no, oh, where are we going? I'm, it's a Mac, I apologize, I'm not a Mac user. Um, how do I, there we go, I'm gonna click there, and I'm gonna click there, and we're gonna play. So this organism on your slide that you currently can't see, but then you will, is called the sea sapphire. So it's a small marine crustacean, and it's probably one of the most beautiful inconspicuous, conspicuous organisms there is. And what this is, is an example of structural coloration. So what's happening is in its shell, it's got special cells, they're hexagonal, and if the light um, is oriented in the wrong way, it's completely invisible. But if it orientates so the light shines directly at the carapace, it flashes back with this iridescent blue color. Um, and it's a really incredibly beautiful organism in my opinion. So why have I chosen to show you this organism? Well, what it highlights is a really good example of sexual dimorphism. So if you look at the two organisms on your slide, the organism on your right, as you look at it, is that male. You can see its shell with that hexagonal structure. And the organism on the right is a female. And you can see it's got a completely different body plan. More importantly, these organisms live in completely different habitats. So the male's benthic. It lives on a coral reef um, and it kind of it lives on the floor on the coral reef. The female is parasitic. So it lives attached to fish up in the water column. Now, it's believed this um, flashing of the iridescent blue is to attract females down off their parasitic host to the males to reproduce. So the females have evolved to have very big eyes, whereas the males don't. So you've got an example here in this species. Um, sex is really important for the, not only kind of how the organism interacts with its environment, but more importantly, the environment it actually lives in. And what I wanted to highlight here is what we're talking about in the focus of this lecture is on sex, sexual or the biological attribute distinguishing between male and female organisms. And this can include genetic, hormonal, gonad and reproductive anatomy. Okay, and it's important to point out this is different to gender identity because gender identity is a socially constructed personal identification and it's based on an individual's personal kind of how they associate with society. And obviously that's a really important trait in humans but we cannot assess that in animals because we can't get their kind of um, association with society. So in biosciences outside of the human um, species, it's always sex that we're referring to, not gender. Okay, so realizing kind of de defining what sex is, does sex really matter for biosciences research? And I'm gonna kind of put the um, opposite to that. What happens if we fail to consider sex in a biological context? So thinking of an experimental example, this is um, a theoretical example at the moment. And as you can see here on the slide, you've got um, two populations of organisms and we're going to expose them to an environmental parameter. It can be anything, but let's call it global warming. So the group on the left here um, is normal conditions. The group on the right is increased temperature and we've got a response variable. So let's call it size. So um, looking at the size of these organisms. If we fail to account for sex, what we're assuming in terms of this example, sex is pooled, is this, there is no difference between males or females under any condition. So what we're assuming here is that males um, in the orange triangles and females in the blue diamonds have exactly the same size profile across the population. And more importantly, they respond exactly the same way to climate change. So that's what's happening if we pool sexes and we fail to account sex in our research. But what might we be missing by doing so? So there's a number of different biologically important phenomena we might be missing if we fail to account for sex. The first one in the middle here is what if there is a difference in the size of these different organisms? In the human population, we know males tend to be typically taller. This could be the same in this example. So here the males are larger than the female, but they, they respond in exactly the same way to that environmental parameter. So if we fail to account for sex, we would miss that response. 
What about when males and females are exactly the same normally, but they have a different response to the environment? And in this case, you can see with warming, males increase in size, females decrease in size. And again, failing to account for sex would mean we'd miss this important response. And then critically, what about when they differ both in baseline and response? So here in the example, you can see females in this case are larger than males, but when you expose them to a future condition, actually males increase their size and females decrease it. And these are really, again, really important biological attributes that we would miss failing to account for sex. This is all theoretical, so does this ever play out in the literature and in the research? So this is a new study um, by a colleague of mine, Gemma Cripps, based at Swansea, um, and she did exactly this. So again, we're looking at a marine copepod, a crustacea, and she exposed them to low, um, or sorry, low seawater pH, elevated um, seawater PCO2. Now, this is a phenomenon called ocean acidification, and it's a type of climate change that's occurring in our oceans. Now, what she showed, we, she measured the difference in respiration rate. So that's the amount of oxygen the animals are taking from their environment to live normally. And you can see here, under normal present-day CO2 conditions, females use less oxygen than males do. But when you expose them to a future climate change scenario, females increase their respiration rate and males decrease their respiration rate in this species. Really importantly, by pooling sex, you completely lose this subtle biologically important difference in the research. And therefore, you would misinterpret the impact of climate change on this species as being unimportant, whereas actually it can have really important implications for the population stability of this species if you're differentially affecting males and females. So we know that theoretically sex can be really important and we know that there's experimental examples of sex being um, shown to be having a really important impact. So what's the extent of sex consideration in biosciences more generally? Well, actually, um, even in biosciences, so the National Institutes of Health is the largest um, clinical funder of um, um, biomedical research. But throughout biosciences, sex is largely considered unimportant except for reproduction. Okay, and it wasn't until 1985, so in my lifetime, that it was man mandated by the National Institutes of Health that we uh, include women in clinical trials. And actually, it's more kind of um, damning than that. It was only much more recently, in the 90s and early 2000s, that they made, um, mandated that you included men and women, and you disaggregated the results based on sex. So this is only a really kind of recent change in clinical research. And actually, biomedicine is one of our most advanced fields, so it's not surprising that perhaps it might not be more widely considered elsewhere. But what implications might this have? Well, actually, there's some really shocking statistics from a few um, examples within society where this could have a real big problem. So one of them is in medicine. So actually, um, between 1997 and 2000, eight out of 10 drugs were removed from market because they posed a greater threat to women than they do men. And that's because all the clinical trials were done on men, and therefore subtle um, threats or kind of sensitivities that were um, present in women were not being picked up at those clinical trial stages. And therefore, when they were released for market into the general population, there was more um, kind of challenge for women. Um, similarly, between 1998 um, and 2008, women were 47% uh, more likely to suffer serious injury in um, car crashes in America. And this is, again, because crash test dummies and seatbelts are designed for average man. Society is largely designed for average man, and therefore they were ill-fitting for women, and it resulted in more serious incidents. So you can see here, sex, where it's not considered, can have a really big implication, both for scientific research and also for society. So as I said, that's an example from biomedicine. So what's the incidence within climate change research, my field, um, and understanding sex in a um, kind of climate change context? To help understand this, I actually undertook a, a large study back in 2017 to try and at least um, uh, measure the, kind of, the rate of consideration of sex within bio kind of climate change research. So this is a study we undertook, um, and we assessed all papers that had experimentally tested ocean acidification. So this is that change in seawater chemistry that's caused by climate change. We narrowed these studies down. There's 4,000 studies to start with. We narrowed these down to around 500 studies that experimentally tested the response of climate change in these four groups. So echinoderms, this is your sea stars and sea urchins. We've got crustacea here with uh, lobsters and crabs. You've got mollusks, which include scallops, mussels, and some of the cephalopods like octopus. And then you've got fish. What we did was we looked at all of those studies and we categorised them based on the level of consideration of sex. So it was either they didn't consider sex at all or mention it, they mentioned sex, they accounted for sex, um, but they didn't test it, 
They tested for um, sex, but they didn't um, analyze it statistically. And then finally, the last one is they statistically tested the impact of sex on the organism result. Now, it's only that last category that actually really gives us any information on whether males and females um, respond differentially to climate change. So what did we find? Well, actually, what we found is only 3.7% of those studies tested for sex-based differences statistically. So 94% of studies failed to assess whether males and females differentially respond to climate change impacts. And this means we're missing a huge part of the picture. More importantly, 85% of studies failed to mention sex at all. There's no mention of sex, male, female, hermaphrodite, anywhere in the paper. And therefore, again, it shows this real kind of problem of overlooking sex and the importance of sex within the biological literature. Now, one of the questions I um, was regularly asked when we first published this paper is, is, is that just a sign of the fact that sex is unimportant? So there's not a lot of research out there because some of the early research was done and it was shown to be unimportant. So some of the answers, um, the answer is basically no, it's, that's not the case. And some of the ex examples of that to highlight that that we have from this paper, I'm going to present now. So one of the first ones was undertaken by a colleague of mine, Haruko Kurahawa. She's based out in Tokyo, in Japan. And she exposed these shrimp, um, an intertidal shrimp, to elevated CO2. And they found that they, these organisms had higher, before females of these organisms had higher mortality, higher sensitivity than the males. During my PhD, I um, investigated the response of mussels um, to climate change. So I looked at ocean acidification, so reduced seawater pH, but also increased temperature and a bacterial pathogen. And what we showed here was that we looked at the cellular, um, kind of cellular function, um, or metabolomics as it's called. So that's all the cellular functions of life, basically, in the organism, the changes in chemical composition in the cells to allow that organism to function. And what we showed was actually, whilst females were more impacted by low seawater pH, males were in, um, in fact impacted more by the increased temperature and the pathogen exposure. So it's not only that these different species, males and females, are differentially um, impacted by one stressor, they also are differentially um, sensitive to different stresses in combination. So it shows there's a real intricate um, kind of role for sex to play in the sensitivity of organisms in response to climate change. Another really interesting study done by Laura Parker down in Sydney, looking at the Sydney rock oyster, showed that actually if you expose Sydney rock oysters to um, elevated CO2 in, adult, um, in the adult phase, the next generation had 16% more females. So they were showing here that climate change is actually altering the sex ratio of the population. Now, anecdotally, actually, for um, aquaculture, which is one of my main areas of research, this could be really beneficial because um, farmers want more females in their populations because they're more desirable for the consumer. But obviously, that's in a um, very kind of specific context. And actually, in terms of understanding the ecology of this species, could have really important implications. And again, we'll touch upon that in a little bit. So that's looking at the role of sex in understanding kind of climate change research. And we know um, that kind of it's largely overlooked. So why might that be? Well, as scientists and as society, we're really habituated to assume that genetic sex determination is normal. So it's chromosomally determined, XX for female, XY for male, and that's the status quo. We're kind of predetermined to understand that sex is determined at fertilization. It's fixed throughout life and it is <coughs> binary. Okay, so remember this is, we're kind of, this is an assumption um, and we're habituated to do it because of those long-standing um, yeah, kind of perceptions within research. And it's widely perceived that actually um, exceptions to this are received as aberrant or strange. So there's a real kind of, kind of mentality um, shift that's required here to move away from this. And actually, I think really looking at nature offers us exactly that kind of lens with which we can change perceptions. And I want to do that with uh, marine organisms and talk you through a number of ways in which actually moving beyond the binary and biosciences can help us understand organism responses and actually look at the diversity of sex within nature. And I'm going to do that in a number of different organisms. But one of the first thing we're going to look at is, um, in kind of marine research is the fact that 30% 30 30 of animal species display hermaphroditism. So I'll explain what hermaphroditism is, but that's certainly moving beyond the kind of binary consideration of males and females in the species. Sex change is really prevalent. So organisms aren't one um, sex for their entire life. They can change sex. I and mean, there's a lot of examples of ways at which that can occur. And more importantly, sex isn't just determined genetically, but it's determined by a suite of environmental and genetic factors that can influence whether an organism becomes male or female. This has really important implications both in terms of this population stability, but also its sensitivity to climate change. 
So the first example we're going to, or first um, phrase we're going to look at is looking at the hermaphrodite. So this is an organism that has both male and female sex organisms in the same individual. Now this can be one of two ways. It can either be simultaneous. So that's an individual that has both male and female um, sex organs in the same individual at the same time. Now the example we've got on the slide here is of a, a sea chain, a sea, yeah, sea hair mating chain. So it's a type of marine sea slug and all marine sea slugs are hermaphroditic. So what you can see here in this, in this slide is these individuals are acting both as male and female. So each, the, each individual is passing a packet of sperm to the individual in front of it. It's receiving a packet of sperm from the individual behind it. So it will fertilize the individual in front and it will be fertilized by the individual behind. So it's functioning both as a male and a female biologically simultaneously and it continues to do this throughout its life cycle. Conversely, we've got sequential hermaphrodites. And one of the really good examples of this that was kind of showcased by Blue Planet 2, the BBC documentary, is that of the Asian sheep's head wrasse. So this is the, the lovely looking fish on your slide. And what they've got is a large dominant male at the top of that social hierarchy, below which are all females in the population. And that gives that male that kind of dominant position within the um, population in terms of reproductive prowess. But when that male kind of um, reproductive output demises and it's kind of um, slowing down, what happens is the largest female will change sex to male. It will then challenge that dominant male. And if it can oust it from the population, that dominant male becomes extra sized and the, that new male will take part the kind of the position within that population and gain that kind of um, optimal position within that um, hierarchical structure. So you can see that that happens um, in terms of, has a really important implication, both in terms of the reproductive output of the individual, but also in terms of the reproductive output of the population more generally. So that's why kind of demonstra a demonstration of um, hermaphroditism within nature and the, the, the role that actually moving beyond the binary is something we should be really looking at to understand with respect to climate change. But what about sex determination and understanding why fish are males, or, or why organisms, I should say, are males or females? And again, in this sense, we're going to look at fish as a really fantastic example of that. Now, as I said, in humans, um, sex determination is predominantly or it's in, exclusively genetic um, in terms of the chromosomal position. But actually, within fish, there's a whole range of sex determining factors and um, um, ranging from major genetic factors. So carp, like us, have a major genetic factor that determines sex. Sea bass, however, have minor genetic factors. These could be um, the presence of a single gene or even gene expression can influence the sex that an individual turns out to be. However, there's this thing called environmental sex determination. So the Atlantic silver side is a fish species at which the temperature it resides in influences whether an individual becomes male or female. Now, this is probably the most um, kind of aberrant for all of us in terms of understanding sex determination and looking at those different um, kind of the most unusual examples of that to understand how diverse sex is within nature. So here's some really nice examples of where the environment in which an organism resides can influence whether that organism becomes male or female. So Japanese flounder, for example, if the temperature is too cold or too hot, they produce more males. If the temperature is optimal, they produce more females. So the individual would become either a male or female based on temperature. In zebrafish, if the oxygen is too low, there's more individuals within the population. In eels, it's crowding. So if it's very crowded, you again have more males. And you can see a bit of a theme here. Conversely, in zebrafish, if there's faster growth, there's more females. And what all of this points to is typically where there's more optimal environmental conditions, you produce more females because fe um, pro egg production is more expensive energetically. Conversely, where conditions are suboptimal, you produce more males because that's where the genetic variation in your population comes from. So by having more males, you've got more chance of adapting um, and kind of overcoming environmental challenge and waiting out for the new time for when conditions become more favorable to lay down um, those kind of energy reserves for increasing the population size. Now, that's a number of environmental parameters, but also social status, as in with the sheep's head wrasse, can really di dictate whether an individual becomes male or female. And a clownfish is another really good example. So in this case, it's a dominant female at the top of the family structure, below which there's one dominant male who will mate with that female, below which all other males are subordinate. Now, to um, show you kind of the implications of that, um, as I said, clownfish are therefore a sequential hermaphrodite again. Now, let's see if we can make this video work without jumping ahead. Um, there we go. So you can see here, this is a female clownfish on a coral reef, and you can see they're highly territorial. So she swims up and bites the tail of this black-tipped reef shark, <laughs> trying to protect her family. 
Um, you can, that's incredibly plucky. That fish must be at least 100 times her size. In this instance, she survives, and it's all OK. But you can imagine that if that shark had turned around and eaten her, what would have happened? Well, actually, what would have happened is that large dominant male who was mating with her before would have turned into the female. And then everyone in that social structure moves up one rung on the hierarchy. So what does that mean? Well, it means actually, Disney, sorry, <laughs> you've got this one wrong. So we know that actually in Finding Nemo, when Nemo's mum's eaten by the barracuda, then they ensues a crazy, um, like, uh, uh, hide-and-seek kind of finding story across the ocean with Marlin trying to find Nemo. Actually, what would have happened is Marlin's, um, Marlin would have turned into Marlene, um, become the dominant female in the population, and eventually Nemo, when he got to um, reproductive age, would have become the dominant male in that story. It's a very different story, very kind of probably not really Disney-worthy, but it really highlights the importance of sex change and consideration of sex and the, the kind of how intricate and dynamic it, be, dynamic it can be in nature. So that's all into understanding the social implications of um, sex change. But what about climate change and how might climate change interact with sex change to really influence population stability? And the example I'm going to give here is temperature sex determination in turtles. So what we know is marine turtles, are, their sex is determined by temperature, and more importantly, the egg incubation temperature within the sand. So if the temperature, again, is rather cold, you'll have more males, and if it's warm, you have more females. So a recent study uh, by Janssen et al. has looked at this phenomena in the, um, on the Great Barrier Reef and looked at green sea turtles. And they looked at two sites, the northern Great Barrier Reef and the southern Great Barrier Reef. Now, remember, this is in the, um, in the southern hemisphere. So as you move more southerly, it becomes colder. So that's something to remember. It's a little bit different to here. And what they showed was the cooler southern Great Barrier Reef population had 68% female. So whilst it's slightly female biased, this is completely stable and um, able to maintain population stability. Conversely, the northern Great Barrier Reef population is 99.1% female. And that's because of climate change increasing the egg incubation temperature of the species and therefore changing that um, sex ratio due to climate change. And what it shows is actually, as we're warming up the planet, we can be pushing species towards extinction, certainly locally, due to imminent warming. And certainly this population will become unstable because of that global warming. And again, it shows the importance of considering sex, sex change and sex ratio in a population to understand its stability to climate change and climate. So through the talk I've shown you in, in terms of the importance of considering sex, how it can impact our research, why we need to move beyond the binary and considering sex change is vitally important and also shown why it's important for understanding climate change. So why don't we do it more widely? What's the challenge in terms of understanding sex and sex change in um, nature? And as, as I said, one of the main challenges is the wide assumption that beyond reproduction, sex is not important. And that's something we really need to challenge. Secondly, and something that might actually factor into that is actually, whilst in many species, sex can be um, apparent in terms of morphology, um, and the example on the slide here of this crab, it's really apparent in males and females. So you can see underneath the, um, the, the, bot, um, the underside of this crab, this is a female, and this is called the telson. And you can see in the female, it's got a nice broad telson, and in the male, it's very narrow. Now, biologically, the reason for that is because the female broods her eggs underneath that structure. So when she's buried, which means she's carrying fertilised eggs, they're maintained under there and she'll fan them to maintain the environmental conditions. That's not a role that the male has to play and therefore it's um, really, again, this is um, sexual dimorphism. You can visually see the sex, change, or the sex difference in these two species. But in many species, it's not possible to do so non-invasively. And my favourite animal, the marine mussel, which is the one a lot of my research is on, you cannot tell sex non-invasively. So you have to sample that species destructively to tell if it's a male or female. And this is a real barrier to including sex in research because obviously by killing that organism, you're impacting the ability to get valid, um, valid data from it. Now, both of these things has then really led to a lack of experimental evidence from the literature with which to kind of substantiate the importance of sex within biological sciences. And this is something, again, we really need to challenge. And working with um, kind of the European Commission, this is something I'm really passionate about, kind of trying to change policy within scientific research to see how we can mandate the inclusion of sex within research, or at least mandate that you need to show why sex is unimportant before you can exclude it validly. So in summary, hopefully what we've shown here is sex impacts a, a wide range of different um, endpoints, physiology, behavior, reproduction, and population level effects. 
It's, sex is very diverse in the ocean. It's complex, and in many cases, it's environmentally determined. Less than 4% of climate change studies consider sex, despite this diversity and the potential role it's got in terms of dictating how an organism re will respond. And finally, failure to account for sex can have huge implications in terms of understanding climate change predictions that we're currently missing a large part of the picture from. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening um, and ask if anyone's got any questions.